Good morning to everyone uh, from the United States and uh, good afternoon to those of you connecting from Europe. Thank you very, very much for joining us this morning and this afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, General Jim Jones, the United States Marine Corps retired and is the chair of the Three Seas Programming at the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. I'm delighted to welcome you to this timely conversation on the Three Seas Initiative Investment Fund. Obviously, this event comes at a very somber moment. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has returned war to the European continent and threatens not just Ukraine, but the entire Western alliance, uh, and especially among our Central and Eastern European allies. While the three seas and the entire region of Central Europe have long been of critical importance to the West and the Atlantic Alliance, their security and priority have only become more critical since Russia launched its latest aggression. I've seen the importance of this region firsthand during my time as NATO's uh, military commander, and I have witnessed the looming and destabilizing threat Russia constantly poses in the region. Our central uh, European allies and, and friends have not forgotten this threat, and neither should we in the West. And this is where the Three Seas Initiative comes in. A project launched and led by the Central and Eastern European countries to accelerate the development of cross-border transportation, energy, and digital in infrastructure. The Three Seas Initiative is key to completing a Europe that is whole, free, secure, at peace, and I might add, prosperous. That vision is under great challenge today, and more must be done to reinforce Central and Eastern Europe and further its integration into a wider and more resilient community of European democracies. That is why the three C's and its goals are even more important and more urgent today compared when the, to when the initiative was launched in 2015. The Three Cs Initiative Investment Fund is the initiative's institutional core. And as we approach the Three Cs Summit and Business Forum that will take place in Riga this June, this is an opportune time to take stock of the investment fund, the progress it has made, its priorities, and the way forward. To discuss this critical topic of importance um, of the Three Cs Initiative, I'm pleased to welcome some of the foremost experts on the three C's from the region and the United States. Before I welcome our first speaker, let me turn to my co-chair of the council's three C's programming, the distinguished ambassador, Ambassador Georgette Mosbacher. Georgette, would you like to add anything? Thank you very much, General. Uh, let me just say that the three C's investment fund is a dedicated commercial fund targeting infrastructure investment in the Three Seas region. But you're asking yourself, I'm sure right now, okay, another fund, no, it is not just another fund. And let me explain why it is so important, so unique, so uh, innovative, that I think it will be a model for public-private partnerships in that the infrastructure projects uh, are uh, designed to be uh, a, a com and competitive with a rate of return. But what makes this fund unique is that the investors in this fund are the countries of the Three Seas region. So when an investor comes to this fund uh, to invest in one of these projects, their partner is that country. And when you think about uh, having the country that you're, you're doing the, the project in as your partner, that's very compelling because they have to be accountable for the money that they've invested. And they are now invested in its success. And that makes it unique and very attractive. And I think that's something we shouldn't forget and something that we should certainly uh, promote. Uh, the fact that the countries are invested alongside the private sector 
And therefore, uh, the guarantee for success is much greater. Thank you. Thank you, Georgette. And, and thank you for the incredible energy and commitment uh, that you brought to the Three Cs Initiative. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to work with you and to know you in this capacity. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our kickoff speaker, Ambassador Andres Tegmanis. Ambassador Tegmanis serves as the Chief of Staff to the President of the Republic of Latvia, who will host the Three C Summit in June. Uh, Andres is well known in Washington, where he served as Latvia's Ambassador to the United States. He has also served as Ambassador to the United Kingdom, to Germany, Russia, and Austria, among other places, and in top positions and Latvia's foreign ministry, including as a state secretary. Before I turn the floor over to the ambassador, let me note that this, dis this discussion is on the record. And after his remarks, I will turn the microphone over to Ian Brzezinski. Mr. Ambassador, the virtual floor is yours. Welcome. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, and my thanks to Atlantic Council for organizing uh, this event and for its very long-standing support to 3Cs initiative. Uh, Latvia is presiding over the 3Cs uh, in this year and we will host the next 3Cs summit and business forum uh, in Riga, June 2021. Um, this will be uh, the seventh summit uh, and it will, uh, it will give a, a real challenge for us and, and we are concentrating uh, very much on our um, priorities. Uh, our, our priorities, I would mention some, uh, to get high level participation at the summit. So far, we have got really good response from, from presidents. Uh, we are working on contribution to the Three Seas Fund from member states and from our partners. And I, I appreciate very much uh, the substantial move in United States uh, as a um, United States contribution. Uh, we will work on our uh, extension of uh, st strategic partners. Uh, well, we have already Germany, European Commission, United States, but also we see a growing interest from other countries like Japan, United Kingdom, France, Canada. Um, we are concentrating, and that's a topic we'll discuss today, on involvement on private investments to the three C's investment fund. Um, we will work on um, and, and organize our business forum uh, to uh, attract uh, targeted investments uh, to transport energy, digitalization projects, uh, green uh, projects in whole three C's uh, region. Uh, business forum will discuss and provide uh, long-lasting benefits for development in uh, all these uh, areas uh, in, in three seas regions and uh, member countries. And we want to, to make some more visibility among um, three seas member countries and bring three seas idea closer to hearts and minds of people. Therefore, we are organizing uh, a month before uh, the summit, we will organize uh, three seas civic society forum I should also mention that during the summit, uh, there will be also a parliamentary forum that will discuss all the relevant political and business priorities of, of 3C's initiative. Uh, we will build um, on that what we have achieved, uh, and we will discuss this in, in summit and business forum. It's not just about boosting the economy, uh, of today, but building economy for tomorrow. We want to have a meeting to focus uh, how we can achieve uh, a better resilience, better connectivity, especially north-south con connectivity of the member countries of Three Seas region. And of course, having in mind uh, all the last uh, events we are having, uh, I mean, the, the war in, in uh, Ukraine, Particularly, uh, attention will um, pay to Ukraine and what we can do uh, with Ukraine, how uh, Three Seas region can cooperate with Ukraine. Uh, our aim, aim is to foster tangible results, fo focusing on uh, few ambitious, uh, but still achievable uh, deliverables, so we can transform our vision into actions. 
Uh, to translate this ambition to specific pro projects, 3C's invest investment fund has been established, uh, and we will hear more about uh, these activities uh, today. Uh, 3C's investment fund, while adding significant value to the initiative, complements the EU investment and cohesion strategy. So it's really a part of EU policies, EU investment. It seeks to attract both public and private investments and supports priorities for in the areas of cli for climate, green mobility, transfer, digitalization, and energy. Uh, the contribution of all three C's participants to the uh, investment would be one of the key deliverables, uh, including a contribution from all our uh, strategic partners. I'd like to highlight the importance of United States as a strategic partner and its support for uh, this initiative uh, going over many years and to, um, well, actually from the beginning of the initiative and uh, investments in a 3 cs fund. Uh, certainly, uh, U, U, U.S. Uh, ownership uh, would encourage all three C's countries as well private investors. Well, you, you may know the three C's region is the fastest growing uh, region in European Union with a uh, very attractive return of investments around 6% um, over uh, the last 10 years. That is well, one point times uh, higher than in Western Europe. And while this uh, growth is not exhausted, it's uh, going on. In conclusion, uh, I'd like to say that I hope that many of uh, participants that are watching this um, uh, conversa uh, conversation today will be a part of Business Forum in Riga. I see the raising interest. Uh, I will be welcome very much. Uh, many business uh, companies, uh, business community, especially not only from 3 C's region, but also from uh, countries uh, well, far away from, um, from 3 C's region, like uh, United States, uh, Canada, United Kingdom, France, Japan, South Korea, and many others. So welcome to um, Forum, welcome to 3 C's Summit. I'm really looking forward to the, this uh, conversation, the discussion, and of course, to uh, welcome to um, 3 C's for Summit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and uh, thank you for those uh, stimulating remarks. We set, set the stage for a lively discussion. Let me now turn it over to uh, our good friend, uh, Ian Brzezinski, who has been one of the stalwart champions of uh, the entire project since day one. He was there at the, <laughs> at the creation, so to speak, and uh, the vision and has been a, uh, just a, a terrific uh, advocate here in Washington and elsewhere. Uh, there could not be a 3Cs function without Ian being deeply involved and uh, this morning is no exception. So Ian, over to you for your magic. Thank you, General Jones. Can, can you hear me? Kind of Loud and clear. Fantastic. Well, thank you very kind with your, your you're very generous. Uh, I see many founders here on the table and it's a privilege to be a moderator for this session. I'm Ian Brzezinski, I'm a senior fellow of the Atlanta Council, and uh, I get to support General Jones and Ambassador Moshbacker in their capacities as chair and co-chair of the Atlanta Council's three C's uh, work stream. Ambassador Tekmanis, Andres, thank you so much for your opening remarks. You know, your country has a great ambassador here in Washington and Mariselga, but you're still missed for your contributions to the U.S. Latvia bilateral relationship when you served so many years here in D.C. And, I really noted your emphasis on the upcoming seventh 3C Summit and Business Forum, and you noted the drumbeats of events that are leading up to that, which I think will surely be kind of an important event of bringing a, an important and catalytic mix of government, but most importantly, commercial sector people to Riga to drive this initiative forward. And Ambassador Marshbacker, you're so right in emphasizing that the 3Cs and 3Cs Fund in particular really is a unique and innovative public-private partnership. Yes, launched with government funding, but leveraging the power of the free market to drive infrastructure growth. And I really do, I share your belief. It can be a model for other regions and for that matter, build back better agenda advocated by President Biden and the G7. 
As General Jones noted, the Three Cs Fund is the institutional core, in my view, of the Three Cs Initiative. And it has basically three missions, in my view, and we'll hear more from our panel on this, but it's a catalyzed cross-border infrastructure, catalyzed cross-border infrastructure projects, kick them off and getting, driving them forward. It's to attract capital to its fund into the region so it can do more in this first task. And then as, as a unique public-private partnership, it really is a, almost like a beacon that sheds a spotlight on all the opportunities present in Central and Eastern Europe, across Central and Eastern Europe. It's a beacon to that trillion dollars plus of foreign direct investment capital circulating in the globe, looking for stable, positive returns. And as Andres pointed out, with a region that provides a rate of return of 6%, Central and Eastern Europe place is a place that deserves a hard look. So we're gonna do a deep dive on the fund, its objective, the structure, its progress and its way forward. And we have a great panel. We're joined by, by Bejada Dajinska Muzika, President of the Managing Board of the Polish Development Bank, BGK. She's someone who brought to that position a successful career in commercial banking at Santander Bank Polska, where she developed a reputation as a constructive change agent, introducing new forms of electronic banking and organization culture. She's globalized BGK. And to demonstrate her, her credos as a change agent, she and her team generated the concept for the Three Cs Fund launched it in 2017 and transformed it into something that's operational in 2020. And she, chair, she shares, serves as the chairman of the Three Cs Fund Supervisory Board. Joe Filipez is a senior investment director at Amber Infrastructure Group. He brings a storied career in investment banking in the infrastructure sector. At Dalmore Capital, he led their successful bid to finance a 4.3 billion pound tideway tunnel under the Thames River. He orchestrated major investments. These are $100 million projects, uh, larger than 100 million, multi-hundred million dollar projects in wind farms, national gas grids, and water infrastructure. He joined Amber in 2020, and he leads the fund's management role in the Three Cs Fund. He's in many ways a commercial face of the Three Cs Fund. Ambassador Georgette Moshbacker, Atlanta Council's co-chair of its Three Cs programming at the Atlanta Council. She's a former U.S. ambassador to the Republic of Poland, that was just her last position. And my brother is out there in that capacity now. And I have to say, she set a high bar for him. He'll make it, but it won't be easy. It won't be easy. She brings a robust business background in the cosmetics industry, which is highly competitive, transforming two companies into international powerhouses. She has her own firm now, the Georgia Moshbacker Enterprises. And I have to say, as ambassador to Poland, she not only deepened the U.S.-Poland bilateral relationship, but she served as the interagency lead for the United States on three C's, making it a priority for the last administration's Europe policy. Adam Hitchcock, long friend, time friend of the Atlantic Council. He's a managing partner at Patch Capital Partners, a residential real estate financial institution. He brings a long career in, in, in investment and government service. Uh, he was on, he's on the board of Sovereign Infrastructure Group, a global infrastructure business. And he served as a managing director at Guggenheim Partners, one of the largest financial institutions in the world. He served in the White House, both in the Office of Chief of Staff and the Council of Economic Advisors during the Obama administration. And he was with us from the very beginning in the Atlantic Council's work on three C's and his insight and counsel has been invaluable to us. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with a mini quick presentation on the Three Cs Fund. I'm gonna ask Beata to provide some introductory remarks. Joe is gonna provide a deep dive on the Three Cs Fund. And then we're gonna have a free rolling discussion with, with, with our panel. And I encourage uh, those in the audience, so to speak, please send in questions. You can use your question chat function um, at, 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 at the bottom of the chat function, or excuse me, the question and answer function. You'll see at the bottom of your screen on the right-hand side. Hit that, and load in the question, and we'll do what we can to bring it to the table. So with that, let me turn to Beata. Beata, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, uh, Donald Jones, and uh, Georgette. Uh, they invited us. And, and thank you for your all support for the Trisys. 
initiative and the power that trees is fund. It is hugely important how we as a joint power fight about this region. And today when we have uh, witnesses and we are facing this very uh, tragic moment with the war in Ukraine and we as at the closest border, uh, cl closest neighbors uh, to Ukraine as a Trisis region, it is very important how we can uh, develop our region, how we can build and uh, build a stronger uh, region as a eastern flank of NATO. It is hugely important and nowadays it is uh, easier to understand uh, to investors and the interlocutors why the Trisis region is so important. Uh, take into account the agenda, the resolution 2030, which was signed in uh, as a United Nation in 2015 when the TRISIS initiative uh, was born. And today we know how many uh, goals in the uh, sustainable development is very important and how we want to build the uh, connectivity on the axis north-south which is hugely important, especially in the in this region. Uh, the, these figures, which was mentioned by uh, Ambassador uh, Andres Teichmanis, uh, it is very important because we are as a, a part of the European Union, it is uh, the, uh, the central eastern uh, part of Europe, it is over 112 million uh, population with this fastest growing region with the total uh, GDP it is about 40 percent uh, and uh, with the with the 30 percent of territory of uh, entire European Union and at the same time we need to spend only for these three sectors as a uh, logistic and transport uh, energy and the digital over uh, six 100 billion euro to build the quality of our infrastructure which will be comparable to the western part of europe it is a huge challenge and i strongly believe it it was the reason that we encourage our colleagues in in this 12 countries to set up the trisis fund just to help through the commercial uh, vehicle as a trisis fund is to speed up this uh, the development in process to develop uh, this infrastructure and i strongly believe that uh, joe phillips uh, will bring you more details how it is important to invest through the trisis fund uh, not as a hobby but as a business which is very attractive for the private investor as well so thank you very much thank you beata joe the floor is yours deep dive on the three c's Initiative Infrastructure Fund. Ian, thank you very much. Um, I think I, I'm going to put some slides on the screen, so I'm hoping that they will appear shortly. But um, whilst we wait for them to appear, I'm speaking to you today from our offices in Warsaw, um, which is where I'm now based. Um, I, um, I have to say that um, I think that um, what, I've, what I've learned about spending time here in Warsaw is, is how dynamic Warsaw and the region is. And I, I'll talk about that a little more. It's also struck me how difficult Polish is, so I'm not sure I'm ever going to master the language. But um, if we could, if we can move forward, so let, let's um, um, go to the first slide. Um, uh, one more, because I don't think the disclaimer is very interesting. And one, one more again, please. That's perfect. So what I'd like to do is, uh, and, and as I go through this presentation, I, I think there are there are three themes that that will come up again and again: cohesion, convergence, and partnership. Um, but let's start with why does the um, Three Cs Initiative Investment Fund exist and what is the opportunity it has? And, and, and as part of that, it's a, the opportunity is driven by a problem we have to solve together in partnership, public and private sector. So um, the Three Cs uh, Initiative Investment Fund was, I think it can be best described as pol politically inspired, but commercially driven. The reality here is that in, in the... Uh, countries of the Three Seas Initiative, um, they form a very significant part of the population and the economy of the European Union. But after decades of communism, we're left very much behind in terms of economic development and in particular infrastructure. And infrastructure, good infrastructure, is a core part of any economy. And therefore, there is, a, as, as, as Beata has said, a very significant need 
uh, if you like, to play catch up with the rest of Europe in terms of infrastructure investment. And between now and 2030, that, that number is well above 500 billion in the three sectors the fund covers, transport, energy, and digital infrastructure. My personal view is that is a very conservative estimate. Um, so we have a situation where we, we have these EU countries, they have um, a significant need for infrastructure as a legacy of the communist era. But, uh, and there are some real positives here, we have a significant size of economy. And as has been said by a number of people already today, um, the growth historically since the, um, these, particularly since the countries became EU member states and the growth forecast forward in terms of GDP is very much higher than it is in Western Europe. So there's a massive opportunity here for, um, uh, for investors and businesses to play a significant role in the region. I think what's also important is that through the pandemic, um, the, um, the economies in the region have proven very um, uh, resilient indeed. And the bounce back from the, uh, from, from the difficulties of the pandemic is, is certainly appears to be uh, faster than it is in uh, Western, Western Europe. I think most economists would agree that. So we have this, we have, but we still have this challenge. Where do we find the money to rebuild the infrastructure, provide new modern infrastructure? And there's here, there's a very big contrast with Western and Northern Europe. In Western and Northern Europe, over the last 30 years, the infrastructure um, uh, in, um, sector as a, as, a, as, as a sector for private capital has grown from nothing to be probably the majority of infrastructure investments in Western Europe are financed by the private sector at very efficient, um, some might say low costs of capital. In Eastern Europe, that model has not developed as much. And that is one of the things that the fund is there to address. So as well as delivering infrastructure and financing it directly, the fund is there to demonstrate that private capital can, in partnership with public sector, deliver very high quality infrastructure in the region. And what is more, I think over time, the cost of that private capital should fall and should converge with the cost of that pri private capital financing infrastructure development in Western and Northern Europe. So the, there are some key themes here. We want to, we want to build a cohesive Europe um, in many respects, but it's very hard to do that unless it, economically we have convergence and in terms of infrastructure, we have convergence around Europe. So we, we are an enabler as the Three Seas Initiative Investment Fund in demonstrating that that private capital can be um, delivered in um, the Three Seas countries that it in turn will deliver high quality infrastructure. And finally, it will do that at a very um, efficient cost of capital and complement both the public sector um, financing and the need for infrastructure in the region. And as um, uh, the, one of the ambassadors said earlier, if you look at the chart on the right, it is quite clear that um, in terms of um, returns for foreign direct investments, the countries within the three seas region figure very uh, positively uh, when you when you analyze um, where capital is deployed in Europe. So it's not a direct proxy for infrastructure investment, but it is a good indicator. So to summarize, there is an issue. We have we need more infrastructure in the region, but there's also a massive opportunity here to play a significant role in, in the growth of these economies, which I think will, will outstrip the growth in Western and Northern Europe over a considerable period of time in the future. So if we could please move on to the next slide. Turning to the fund itself, let me highlight um, what it is the fund does. Um, we have three sectors that we cover, and we cover them within a defined geography. And that defined geography are the members of the Three Seas Initiative. Now, there are 12 members of the Three Seas Initiative, one of which is Austria. It is quite clear that Austria does not have the legacy issues with infrastructure that uh, the other 11 countries have. So our focus is, is essentially on the 11 countries that were um, subject to the hegemony of the Soviet Union during the communist period and are now EU member states. I won't list them all, though there was a map on page one. Um, and then we cover within that the three sectors of transport, energy, and digital infrastructure. Um, we have a focus on greenfield um, uh, development. And I think it's worth defining what we mean by greenfield. And there are some practical examples later on. 
What we mean is traditional greenfield, where we take a, a, a blank canvas and we deliver a brand new infrastructure asset. But we also include within greenfield acquisition of existing assets that require very significant modernization or very significant expansion. And the common factor here is that what we're what we're trying to do is deliver material capital growth through investing in new infrastructure, whether or not it's by virtue of expansion or modernization or delivering from scratch. And what we'd like to do is deliver to our investors, as has been said, we are a commercial fund, a significant equity return for taking those equity risks um, associated with greenfield infrastructure development. So our target return is 12 to 15 percent over the life of the fund. And the fund itself has a 15 year life, which can be extended under certain circumstances by up to five years. As has been said, the, the fund was largely seeded uh, with uh, close to a billion euros of capital by the development banks and governments in the region. So we have a very significant seed capital. And what we are now doing is we are now seeking private investment for the fund, having made our first three investments. And uh, we made um, an investment in each of the three sectors um, that we cover. I'd like to say that was by design, but I think it was serendipitous, actually. Um, and, and we've deployed about 45% of the capital we've raised to date. So I think we've made a, a very um, significant um, start, um, given that we, we, we began this process in, uh, at the end of February 2020, just as the pandemic began. So, um, uh, and then just to, to summarize here, the, the investment size of the fund is AMBA, and we are uh, focused on infrastructure only. We operate around the world in Western Europe, headquartered in the UK, but also in Australia, and we also have a significant and growing business in the United States. Actually, we're ultimately 70% owned by a US family business. Um, and we are dedicated, uh, the whole team is dedicated to infrastructure investment. And we have a particular specialism in greenfield infrastructure and development of greenfield infrastructure all over the world. So if I can move to the next slide, please. What I'd like to do is, is cover the, the, the structure of the fund. Um, and this is a, a simplified um, slide that shows, shows the fund. So the fund itself, the Three Seas Initiative Investment Fund, is a Luxembourg company that exists under a regulated regime in Luxembourg for investment funds. So it is very similar to many uh, funds that um, uh, private sector investors make investments in in Europe. So we've taken a very standard approach. Um, that, that company in Luxembourg, which is regulated, has a fund board. Uh, which represents the views of the shareholders and acts as the, uh, the both there's a supervisory board and a management board, and they are there to supervise the um, functioning of the fund, but not to make the investment decisions. The investment decisions, if you look at the left of this slide, um, start with AMBA. Our job is to source investment opportunities, uh, to, to manage the diligence process, to deliver investment papers and recommendations to the investment committee, and then to manage the investments that are uh, on an asset management basis that have been made. Um, on that basis, we, we, we deliver those to the investment committee. The investment committee is independent. Three of its members are nominated by AMBA. One is nominated by Fuchs Asset Management, and one is nominated by the shareholders of the fund, but they act independently. So there are five members of that investment committee. The investment committee considers the papers delivered by AMBA and makes investment recommendations to the to Fuchs Asset Management, who are what is known as the AFM, which is the Alternative Investment Fund Manager. Their role is to ensure that any investment that is proposed and recommended by the investment committee meets the um, uh, uh, meets the criteria set out by the fund in its private placement memorandum and in, in its other governance documents, and also complies with law and regulation um, as, it, uh, uh, as set out in Luxembourg. So this is a very standard structure for Luxembourg investment funds, and investment funds in Luxembourg comprise a significant number uh, of these types of vehicles that operate in the European Union. Um, so I think the, um, the key here is that 
the investment decisions are separated from the um, management oversight and the board oversight of the fund to deliver that commercial imperative to make good investment decisions and ultimately to deliver an investment return to the shareholders of the fund. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Let me turn um, to the sectors we cover and give you some examples. And then after that, I'll actually talk about the investments we've made, which I hope will be a little more interesting. So as, as stated, the three sectors we cover are transport, energy, and digital infrastructure. Um, to give you an example in transport, uh, we have um, a pretty broad mandate uh, and it's a very big sector with a very big need in the region. But to give you examples of things we look at, it's roads, um, rail projects, rolling stock for rail, ports and airports. Uh, and as someone said earlier, the main issue here is interconnectivity around the region. Um, historically, the links between North and South are quite poor. And that means that um, there are many examples where traveling from uh, uh, the equivalent distance in, in the Three Seas region compared to Western Europe takes three to four times longer, if not more. And that's on most on, on road and rail. And it also means that um, the uh, interconnectivity opportunities um, that are uh, presented by the proximity of the or the coastlines of the Adriatic, the, the Black Sea, um, are, are not taken advantage of in terms of the freedom of movement of freight in an efficient way. So transportation is a very uh, significant part of our mandate. The second part of our mandate is energy. And again, um, what we're focused on here is energy transition and energy security. Now, within the region, um, there are a number of key requirements. One is to phase out coal generation. So we cannot make coal investments, nor can we make investments in nuclear generation, but we can make investments in renewable generation, in gas generation, in LNG, in pipelines, and in transmission and distribution networks. Um, and I think this is very important. Um, it's quite interesting that um, in the last couple of months since the war in Ukraine began, the um, the importance of gas as a transition fuel in Europe has been recognized finally by, I think, the European Union. I think we were fighting a little bit of a battle about the use of gas in Central and Eastern Europe, but it is clear to me and I think to many others that it is a, uh, an important transition uh, fuel when you move from coal. But it also means that that energy security is particularly important, and that is why transmission pipelines and LNG are very important areas of um, focus for the fund, as well as, of course, renewable generation. The third sector we cover is digital. And um, digital is a, a newcomer to the infrastructure asset class over the last five years. Uh, but I think it's become increasingly clear, particularly through the pandemic, how important digital infrastructure is to the economy. And our focus areas there are fiber networks, uh, telecoms towers, particularly around 5G and data centers. All of these are incredibly important for the development of the economies in, in the Three Seas region and, um, uh, uh, and clearly have become important infrastructure assets for all investors around the world. If we could move on, please, and I will begin, I will start to, one more slide, please. What I would like to do now is talk to you um, about the three investments we've made, and I'll, I think I'm probably running out of time, so I'll try and do it as efficiently as possible. The first investment we made was in Cargo Unit, uh, and Cargo Unit is the largest leasing company for locomotives for freight in Poland. Poland is the second largest freight market in terms of rail within the European Union. Now, the investment thesis behind this was that it's an, exist, an existing asset, but the, the asset we bought had a very old fleet. And, and if you look at the pictures, the locomotive at the bottom is, I think, 48 years old. Not as old as me, but, um, but it, it's certainly getting on a bit. And the one at the top is one of the new locomotives we've acquired since we, um, we took over this business. And essentially what we did here is we bought a very large um, uh, business with a very old fleet. And as the European Union and Poland invests in the um, rail network and the signaling, 
you need to replace the old trains with the new trains because the old trains become inefficient and they can't operate effectively in the market. And the European Union is spending very significant amounts of money on upgrading track and signaling all over the, all over Central and Eastern Europe. And therefore, uh, this is a good example of partnership. It's very efficient for private sector capital to, to acquire locomotives and deliver them for use. It's less efficient for, uh, and there's not a model that's worked particularly well for private capital to deliver track and signaling. So here we have the public sector delivering the track and the signaling and the private sector delivering the modern locomotives they're gonna run on that track. And, um, and we're not only are we going to do this in Poland, but we've already begun to expand this business into Romania. And to give you one statistic to end with, when we acquired this company, the average age of the fleet was 45 years. Our plan over the next nine years is to take the average age of the fleet down to well below 30 years. So a very significant um, acquisition of new locomotives. If we can move on, please. The second investment we made was a, a pure greenfield investment. We, we bought a uh, site with, to build a, um, a data center in Estonia, which is what uh, prides itself of, as being uh, one of the leading digital nations in the European Union. And there we have just completed a, a 70 million uh, data center in the Baltic states based in Estonia, which is the uh, most advanced and largest data center in the region, including um, tier four capabilities. So this is a great example of the fund delivering a world-class facility within the region that um, will play a very important role in, in, in not just in the private sector, but in providing data security for the public sector in the region. And, and this whole um, issue around data security and where data is kept, um, particularly public sector data, government data is becoming increasingly important. We can move on, one more slide. Um, the third investment that we made um, is in Enery. Enery is a renewable developer which has 155 megawatts of existing solar generation in the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Bulgaria. And it has a pipeline of almost three gigawatts of development assets in those countries, plus Romania, Estonia, and Austria. And again, this is a very simple example of us taking a team with a huge development portfolio and providing the capital that will, gen will deliver significant renewable generation in the region. So I think those are three live examples of what we've done with the fund. I think they're all very high quality investments that um, should attract capital globally and are uh, an important seed portfolio as we go to raise that private capital um, from, from investors around the world. Um, the final thing I'll say is that not only having made those three investments, we have a very significant pipeline of projects in gas, in uh, renewable energy, in ports, um, and in logistics and electric vehicles around the region. So we would expect this year to continue to make investments during the course of 2022. And we have a very significant investment pipeline moving into 2023, all of which supports our fundraising activity. And finally, on a very personal note, I think, um, you know, I've been in the infrastructure sector since it began for over 30 years ago. And um, for me, this is a, a fantastic opportunity to work in this region to deliver very high quality infrastructure and to play a role in, in the uh, convergence of this region with Western Europe and Northern Europe, which I think has become increasingly important, not just economically, but geopolitically, um, given the events of the last few months. So I'm immensely proud to be part of the team managing the fund. Thank you. Great. Joe, thank you very much. Beata, thank you very much. That's a great insight into, in, 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 into the fund. I got to say, I was struck particularly by three slides. One is that slide capturing the, the financial magnitude of the infrastructure deficit that has been burdening Central and Eastern Europe. And I think your figures are probably conservative, 500 billion. You indicated it could, could be higher. We've heard figures as high as 1 trillion but this is a pretty good documentation of that challenge. Second, I was really struck by your, the slide on the structure of the fund, and I hope we'll get a little bit into this, which is it shows how this fund, even though its initial billion dollars has come from the gov government side, it is, the fund is firewalled from political interference. So it is operating on purely commercial principles. You have to make a profit. Um, otherwise, you, you won't be running the fund. Um, that's really, really important because that's, that's a powerful signal to commercial markets. And then, of course, the first slide. This is what I would like to turn to the panel to touch in on. 
But that first slide, which is, you know, highlighted the, the opportunity and vibrancy of the region, 112 million people, 3.6% growth, EU membership, $2.1 trillion in combined GDP. Uh, that shows the power of collaboration. A region like that can probably attract more international investment than the individual com com countries themselves. But we are, you know, that, that is a powerful slide. And it, it signals a great investment climate. Climate, but we're right now, and I've got several questions on this from the audience. We're right now in the middle of a of a war just across the border in Ukraine. How is that inv invasion affecting the investment climate in which the fund is operating? Let, let me turn maybe first to Biata and Joe since they're running the fund, and then I want to turn to uh, Georgette and Adam, some kind of commercial expertise on the outside, and see how they view this region. Biata. Uh, I only want to add uh, some small correction. Uh, the investment uh, uh, which was done by and commitment uh, by development institution, it is not government money. Uh, just to be clear, it is commercial money. So, so only one country is this direct money from uh, government. It is only Estonia. The rest it is uh, represented by the uh, development banks, and we are uh, the biggest investors, uh, BGK, with the 750 million euro. It is uh, purely as a commercial. We are the, the in private investors is in many international funds, so we couldn't treat our uh, commitment in the Tracy's fund as a government money. This is purely commercial money. So I want to add this because it's sometimes it is mix of understanding what doesn't mean the TRISIS fund, uh, which was uh, set up by the development institution from this country. It is purely commercial based on the market rules fund, even if there is a, the development institution represent all this country, but it's purely commercial rules. It is only my comments for this, uh, what, what, what you said, it is government. This is not government, okay? But what about Russia? How does the how does the invasion of Ukraine affect the investment environment offered by Central and Eastern Europe today? From from my perspective, uh, I, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, emotion. It is uh, it is normal. It is uh, only one and a half uh, month of uh, this war, and nobody knows what will be the, the next steps. But from the other hand, we are the member of the uh, European Union. We are the member of NATO, and we have to think about uh, how to uh, build and how to invest in this region to build a stronger uh, this region as an eastern flank. Uh, of course, uh, we show the potential. We show uh, our fastest growing region, and the figures uh, shows that uh, this is uh, very important. Uh, Yes, the war uh, shows uh, many questions, for sure. Uh, but uh, maybe I pass voice to to Philip because uh, uh, Joe Phillips, uh, because uh, Joe is uh, the person who is responsible for the fundraising, and this is daily basis uh, activities to talk with the investors and to provide the uh, uh, roadshows. So. Uh, there is the, the more uh, more information from his side. Thank you, Beata. Thank you. So I think um, that there are there are two parts two parts of this story. Um, the first is that obviously um, when the when the outside world looks at the fund and looks at the region, geographical proximity to Ukraine is is for at the forefront of of, of their mind. Um, and then the second part of the story is what is actually happening on the ground. So we have three existing investments. So every day um, since, well, before the uh, actual invasion, when, when uh, we have been looking at the impact on those investments. And I think the conclusion we've reached very firmly is that geographical proximity to Ukraine is not the determining factor as to whether or not an infrastructure asset is, um, is, is impacted. The reality is that some will be impacted in a negative way for different reasons. So there are some um, global macroeconomic issues that have, have become much more pronounced as a result of the war in Ukraine. So inflation in particular, um, uh, cost of funds, interest rates, all of these things are global, but they impact uh, investments wherever they happen to be, including in this region. 
The second thing is that, um, and, and you know, it pains me to say it in some ways, there have been positive impacts in certain investments as well. So if you if if you have a, a energy generation today, the energy price has increased. Generally, that means your returns are uh, are going up. Um, if you operate port facilities in in areas where there are very significant um, agricultural exports, the rates and the uh, the rates for shipping those exports and the and the volumes have gone up. It, it, because of the war in Ukraine. Now, it pains me to say that, but but I think the point we're trying to make to the market as a whole is we're still making investments. Our investments on the ground are largely unaffected um, and, and geographical proximity is not a proxy for the impact. Uh, the example I always give is that if you're in the London financial services community, the impact of sanctions and the war, and the war in Ukraine might be much greater on your business than on the investments that we in the Three Seas Initiative Investment Fund have in cargo unit, in Enery, and in uh, green energy in the region. So, so very strong message from us. Uh, we are. It's it's a slightly counterintuitive in some ways, but it is um, one that we believe we can evidence very strongly. George, Jet, Adam, your careers have straddled government and in, international investment. What's your perspective of the impact of geopolitics on, on the region today as an investment environment? Well, uh, I'll take that first, I guess. Uh, if you look at what we've learned from this, uh, from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it has highlighted the fact that energy security is national security. And um, this was basically a coal burning region. And now they have to transition. But we're also seeing that the EU, uh, 40, they, they are get 40% of their energy from Russia. So all of a sudden they're scrambling as well. And um, I think given the fact that energy is one of the three pillars of the three C's, there's a big opportunity here, not only in the transition, but in the, um, also in nuclear. Now I realize we can't invest in that. Um, I hope we can change that. The EU has changed their regulations on, on nuclear, civilian nuclear. But the opportunities for LNG, um, for the terminals, the pipelines is tremendous. And uh, I think this is one of the, again, uh, coming out of this war. Although many of us knew this, before this happened, uh, Poland in particular was uh, did not renew their contract with Gazprom uh, this year because they put uh, a lot of LNG into play uh, so that uh, they could be energy independent. This is going to be a big opportunity, I think. Adam, you've worked in some rough environments. You've invested globally. Uh, you've been focused on infrastructure. Uh, in Africa and elsewhere, in Central Asia, but now also Central Europe. What's your perspective on the investment climate today in Central and Eastern Europe? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, you know, the investment climate can ebb and flow depending upon, you know, uh, whatever the headline is. Um, but I would say that for this region, you know, the fundamentals remain the same. Um, you know, as others have mentioned, you know, this part of the world is a great investment opportunity. You know, strong growth, rule of law, stability, part of Europe, and so on. But I think the question as it relates specifically to Russia is about what does it mean for these countries if you assume trade and engagement uh, with Russia will be significantly less going forward? How do you replace that with more economic activity amongst themselves and with the rest of Europe and the world, right? And to me, that means there is more need for the Three Seas Initiative. So you're gonna need more significant infrastructure investment because of the way legacy infrastructure was set up, you know, after World War II with a focus on East-West back to Moscow. You know, there needs to be a greater prioritization of integration amongst the three C members, you know, North-South, but also obviously linking back and further integrating with Western Europe. Uh, and as we've mentioned, you know, that need is in the trillions. And the last thing I would say is that you know, the, the critical component for meeting these significant demands is to bring in the global capital markets. Global capital markets are a creation of the West after World War II. They have a lot of the elements that you see in this part of the world, rule of law, property rights, 
transparency. Um, and global markets are the only way to meet this investment need. You know, investments of that scale are going to require the global capital markets. It can't be done by government. Um, and so no country or multilateral bank can provide that capital. So I think the real focus needs to be on mobilizing the global capital markets. I might inject here, uh, Ian, if you may, when you look at uh, another uh, outcome of this, of this war, with respect to now they're talking about putting more troops on the ground, et cetera, uh, in the uh, Eastern flank of NATO, which is this region, you need infrastructure for that. You need roads, you need bridges, you need communications. You will now, I think, see there's an opportunity with respect to the infrastructure for national security reasons in areas that they didn't think of that before. Let me t touch on an issue you raised, um, uh, Georgette, and that's energy security. We've got a couple of questions um, coming in on energy security. And the, the one question is from Elena Poptorova, former ambassador of the United States. Uh, and she asks, how can the fund be helpful with energy diversification projects? Maybe I'll turn that first to, 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 to Joe. Uh, uh, energy diversification. Oh, look, I think um, that's a very good question. Actually, um, let me let me reflect on one thing. For it is true. I, I my personal view is that nuclear has a role to play in 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 the region. So I think that um, it, it will be part of the energy mix. And and although we as the fund can't do it, um, I've 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 worked in financing nuclear with EDF as well in the past. Uh, and so I think that the nuclear will play a role in, in, in energy diversification, energy security in the region, whether or not the fund can invest. Um, the second thing is, is that I think that um, the, there, are, there are a number of, of clear short term needs in terms of energy diversification. One is more renewables in the region, and that is happening. Um, the second is um, better interconnectivity, because it's not just a question of where the generation is coming from. It's a question of interconnectivity around the region, whether it be gas pipelines or, or electricity grid. That's just as important, not just, um, not, not just um, the, 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 um, the source of the energy. And then finally, I think that the, um, uh, and Ambassador Mosbach has mentioned this, gas is very important. And that is something that wasn't universally accepted before the war in Ukraine. I'm hoping that it is now quite clear that gas generation is critically important in the region and, and in Europe as a whole, but that comes with it the requirement to diversify the source of that gas and, and ensure that there's energy security in terms of the supply side. And then there are other things that, that can happen in the region largely, which need to be driven by governments pr providing the regulatory infrastructure to allow things like biogas, hydrogen as it develops, and, and every gas project we do has hydrogen enabled as part of it. Um, and then other things um, such as uh, refuse derived waste, uh, sorry, uh, refuse derived fuel and waste to energy. Again, these all play a role. So, so I think um, that, that much is clear. I, I can't make any further comment on it, Ian, uh, but happy to take any questions. Uh, Great. In due course. You know, I'm going to push a little more on, on, on the political interference issue because I think that's important. And Beata corrected me in terms of uh, the, the role of the funds. But one thing that has come up in some of the questions is that they point out that, you know, development banks, like in the United States, are run by people appointed by governments. Um, and what I thought was very important about uh, Joe's slide is that showed there's a firewall in which is managing the fund, but the actual commercial decisions. Are, are made on merely commercial times. No calls from a, from a president late on an, an election eve saying, please invest here. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that, Beata? And then maybe I'll turn to Andres. Uh, you know, he's sitting in, the, in a president's office and he, maybe he have an interesting perspective on that. Because this is an important, yeah. very, very critical element of, of, the, of, of the fund. Yes, this is exactly what uh, Joe mentioned that uh, we have this structure with, uh, with the 
independent committee uh, which uh, take the, the independent decision it is crucial and very important for, especially for the private investors uh, we as a bgk we are investor in many international uh, venture and uh, for example it is margaret fund we are together with the other development from the western part of european union uh, countries and uh, it, it is a similar structure so independent committee independent people who are uh, uh, running this fund uh, purely under commercial uh, uh, rules. So it is uh, critically uh, important uh, because from the other hand, everybody, if they decide to put money into the fund as a private investor, they want to be sure that there is a clear role how this money will be managed. And uh, there is any uh, special, uh, any single even small uh, influence from the political side. And it was our the main uh, goal to create the fund as a trigger to support, uh, to develop our infrastructure based on the market role and to give the clear uh, roles in this fund through the structure with regist registration in the Luxembourg based on the international law with the independence committee and the structure which is uh, visible and clear and understandable for by everyone but it is as an anecdote i repeating to uh, this many times 12 languages 12 uh, uh, 12 <laughs> countries but international <laughs> law with uh, which will be understandable by every single international investors private investors oh, however uh, beata uh, on a, a comment and maybe you can you you can um, clarify this while this is run as a independent based on market uh, uh, values, etc., the countries have invested in this e because they are invested in their banks, just like Poland is in BGK. Uh, and of course, investors are concerned about the problems with regula regulations, laws, etc., that can hinder certain uh, infrastructure projects going uh, cross border. Um, I think it's important, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's important to realize that these countries in the three C's are um, incentivized to make sure that those regulations, those laws, et cetera, make it very attractive for these investments to cross border. Am I not correct in that? It is correct, and uh, this is what we discussed uh, with uh, investors, and that if you want to invest in the Trisis region, uh, it is better to invest through the Trisis fund because you have the whole picture of all countries and how the connectivity and the infrastructure yeah. that we need in this region is visible when you look on the map and see it uh, from Estonia to Croatia and the Bulgaria, the whole region. Uh, and uh, if we show the picture, why we need this investment uh, in this region and why the cross-border connectivity is so important if we want to build the economy in the in entire region. Uh, and this is an example that we discussed lately with many investors. How many bridges is between uh, Bulgaria and Romania and the river, uh, uh, which is 480 kilometers. And uh, when we ask uh, this question, how many? It is maybe 20, 50, yeah. 30. There is only two. This wow. is uh, there is only two bridges, and th it shows why we need this investment. Of course, this is not for fun. This is uh, as a picture why we need this investment in this region uh, as a part of European Union with the stable. Uh, economy with the fast and growing region with this a very stable uh, legal aspects because we are a member of the european union with our member of the nato and we, with the region with a huge potential that could be developed and how to open uh, broadly these three main gates under our three seas baltic Adriatic and the black sea and to build the connectivity between this uh, between this uh, seas yeah, that was the point I was trying to make, that you've got 12 countries invested 
uh, in the three C's. And it's important to know that it's at the presidential level. And uh, consequently, that really makes these investments very attractive because there is this coordination that you rarely find in, the, in these investments otherwise. And that's what makes this fund so unique. Andres, did you want to jump in on this? Well, um, I, I can I can agree that with uh, with that uh, that all the projects uh, are really commercially driven. But but sometime uh, sometime I think governments need to be these engines or give this inspiration. Uh, what is actually the whole the whole idea of, of three C's? When when governments in in twelve countries discovered that actually well there are very good connections east west but quite missing connections northeast you know, north north south and and they had to give this push they give this inspiration uh, to to make better connectivity well now i think the the big challenge is having um having in the east and reconsidering how how profitable uh, is the business uh, energy business with russia well i think we will face very very uh, huge consequences uh, for many years uh, uh, business with russia and energy business with russia uh, well has has been has, has been running uh, on a commercial base now it has proved that it is politically very risky so it's a, it's it's not business it's government who should make a push but at the same time um I would imagine that the Latvian president would be the very last person who would give instructions to our Latvian Development Bank, who is a member of, of the fund, 3Cs fund, who, who is running the uh, part of the management and uh, assessment of, of the project. He'll be the last person who will give some kind of advice uh, uh, or instructions what to do, how, how, how make assessment of the projects. Of course not. These projects are being assessed on, on the very commercial base, on, on the base of how, how, what, what's the return of investment. And I, I think that's, that's what, what is running across all the pro, this idea is running across the whole, all the, all the projects in, in, um, in, in to three seas countries. Well, of course, we have we are facing new situation in particular uh, in energy business. But well, it has started already uh, quite a many years ago with with third energy package of of European Union, making uh, more uh, more connectivity, uh, more diversification of of sources for for energy, and and this process is going on now. For instance. Well, in, in Latvia, uh, we, we have a project on, on the list of, of three C's LNG. Just yesterday, government gave green lights. Well, Latvia will will go on with, with new LNG terminal. But there are several projects at the Baltic coast uh, for, for new LNGs. In May, we will have a uh, new pipeline connecting Poland and, and Lithuania gas pipeline. Well. Of course, government have to consider what are what what what, what kind of projects are necessary for for the economy. Uh, at the same time, these projects should be um, business uh, business oriented and and viable for, for uh, as a return of um, investments. Uh, so I, I think uh, this the main idea uh, of the management of project of the assessment of project is business approach of course uh, politicians can inspire but politicians can't manage manage the, the business business uh, assessment so it's interesting it's not quite a fire and forget but 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 close let me move on to the commercial side and i want to turn to joe and to adam on this joe could you tell us a little bit more about how you're reaching out to actually bring in commercial investment into your commercial capital into your fund and then as Adam, you're sitting actually in the investment world. I'm kind of, what are your reactions to that? How, what do you, what's your reaction to the viability of that approach, Joe? Yeah. So um, I think the the first thing to say is that um, over the last 30 years, the amount of capital that's available for infrastructure has gone from almost zero 
to um, what is now in most um, pension funds and insurance companies a significant portion of their asset allocation, anywhere between 5 and 15%, in some cases higher. Um, so as a, as a sector, you've seen a massive growth in the amount of capital that's available for infrastructure. However, a very significant majority of that capital has gone into very highly developed economies, Western Europe, Northern Europe, Australia, New Zealand, um, and in different and in quite a different form in the United States. Um, the, the, the reality is that, that those funds largely do not invest in Central and Eastern Europe, and there are many reasons for that. Um, so what we are trying to do is demonstrate through the seed portfolio that it is um, that, that the returns are available, high quality potential investments are available, and that we've got a team on the ground that can do, not just make those investments, but manage them. So we're trying to demonstrate to the infrastructure market that there is a risk there may be a, the perception of a risk premium in this region, but actually the reality is a little different. And what that means in the short term is on a risk adjusted basis, there's a, an attractive investment return to be made compared to investing in a fund that is looking at uh, Western Europe, Northern Europe, Canada or Australia, for example. What that drives is, that? Can I ask what drives that perception? Um, I think it's just history. Um, you know, uh, I, I like to point out that uh, when I was at school, uh, you know, Central and Eastern Europe was closed. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, you couldn't really go there. It was, um, it was behind a wall, uh, both uh, figuratively and literally in some cases. And so it takes, it takes a long time for people's perceptions to change. They are changing. There is infrastructure investment in Central Eastern Europe from the private sector, just not nearly as much as elsewhere. So I think we're going to see a ver an acceleration of capital into the region, but it might take a few years. And I think the fund has an important role in, to play in demonstrating that, that, that attractive investment returns can be made by the private sector in this region and that the perception of risk is actually not, not a real one. And so a little bit back to my point about um, geography, geographical proximity is not a proxy for risk from the war in Ukraine within the European Union, particularly within the NATO member states. So, you know, it's an education process, but the best of, the best way of doing things is to show it rather than education. So that's what we're doing. And we're make we we over the last two years, we've been uh, crisscrossing the world by Zoom uh, to introduce ourselves to investors and to introduce the fund. Um, it has been difficult because investors generally won't invest until they've met the manager and visited the, the investments. But I think we're now well positioned as the world has opened up post pandemic to uh, bring private capital into the fund. Adam, this is like Joe, this is your bread and butter. Like Beata, this is your bread and butter. You're sitting in Chicago leading a major investment house. You've been working global infrastructure for, for many years. Does this strategy make sense to you? I mean, can you go to your clients and say, wow, the investment three C's investment fund is something that is worth, well worth considering? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I agree with everything Joe just, um, just said. And, you know, I, I think that the steps so far are, you know, quite positive with the fund. Um, you know, I, I like to think of it as like, you know, for me, you know, what they're doing is a critical first step. Be, going back to what I said earlier, you still have to deliver the capital markets as a whole. Um, but I think this is a good first step to uh, showing, as Joe said, that you can generate a, a, a really attractive risk adjusted return. And so, you know, the way I think about what they're doing is, you know, their success is not just tied to the total dollars deployed, because no matter how big their fund gets, the need is just going to outstrip it by by many multiples. Um, so to me, what they're doing is, you know, it means more beyond those dollars deployed, the fact that you have all, you know, all these various countries that are participating, right? That is a good signal. And I think that, you know, to me, it's, can you show that this is a model for co cooperation and coordination between the three S the three C's countries, right? You know, having some form of a secretariat or entity that's helping source investment opportunities, things like that would be helpful. If you can see this move beyond um, just what it is now and get traction where there's a place that's sourcing investment opportunities. And, the other thing too is like, you know, a lot of these investment opportunities won't make sense for private equity. I mean, private equity is just a small piece of the overall types of investing that should be occurring there as it relates to infrastructure. Um, you know, there are a lot of these projects that should be uh, 
owned by the government, but financed with debt, but not financed on the balance sheet of those governments, right? So thinking about, are there creative financing structures that could be used, you know, for example, you know, could you be financing some projects with 100% debt by using a reserve fund structure where the national government or a multilateral development bank takes a first loss position, and then the rest of it is financed by the by private debt capital? I think there's a lot of ways to start thinking more creatively about how to crowd in the capital markets uh, and not just um, limiting it to, uh, you know, uh, the way that things have always been done, but being a little bit more creative about ways that that you can do this and then really start to tap into the capital market because that's the only way you're going to meet these massive, uh, massive needs. I think to Joe's point, it's interesting, uh, the creative aspect of this and the fact that you do have uh, all of these countries that are participating. But I'm also um, bothered by the perception point. And uh, th there should be a concerted effort on the part of the three C's initiative to uh, really take a look at that perception question and see how we can um, we we can change that perception. Faster we change that perception, I think the quicker and easier it will be to get that investment money. And um, but to to Joe, Joe's point, we need a secretariat. And we need a team to do that. Here, here. You know, let me move on to one important issue that I think it shapes a bit perception, and that is the U.S. commitment to invest three hundred million dollars through an equity investment into the fund itself. And looking at maybe maybe Beata, could you give us an update on what is the status of those negotiations? Because I have to say, I'm concerned. I don't feel this is a a, a fault of the Three C's Fund. I'm very concerned about the United States balking on an important commitment that was made over a year and a quarter ago. Uh, and it's a commitment that's, I would argue, has even increased urgency as we try Absolutely. to strengthen this help, actually help the Central Europeans do what they're doing on their own to strengthen the economic resilience of an important set of allies of, of, of the United States. So where are we on these negotiations, Beata? Uh, the, the current uh, negotiation is running by uh, Amber Infrastructure, but of course uh, uh, we are doing our best uh, to have a meeting in the New Year's, uh, in the coming, uh, coming weeks uh, with uh, IDFC also to, to give more information what is going on and when we can finalize our agreement because uh, the visibility uh, of US in the Tracy's Fund is very, very important and uh, everybody are... Uh, uh, very carefully uh, observe what is going on and when the U.S. Uh, take the decision to be the, the member of the fund, not only as a strategic partner for the uh, for the three C's initiative on the political level, um, because it is hugely important. It was uh, the some announcement uh, in Munich in 2020, the one billion, and everybody always uh, repeat the same question beata how is it with this one billion dollar in uh, in the fund of course we have a uh, very advanced uh, dialogue with the uh, dfc and uh, fingers crossed everything will uh, finish uh, uh, with the success uh, may I uh, give it the one sentence about the PR awareness about the Tracy's Fund? It is, I fully agree with you. We need this and desperately. The more marketing about the region, about the fund, and uh, one our common initiative it is uh, the Tracy's uh, uh, house in Davos. And I uh, I strongly believe it will be the turning point how to build uh, the. Uh, visibility and understanding why the trees uh, region is so important. Uh, and we start, as Adam said, uh, many investors need to understand what is this region, how to invest in this region, and the diversity of all countries, it is huge. Uh, and we start this long journey, to be honest. From the other hand, what uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Teikmanis uh, uh, mentioned, the role of politician side, it is also very important because as we mentioned at the beginning, it is gaps which uh, total amount of money it is about 500, 600 billion uh, euro dollars, doesn't matter. It is huge amount of money that we have to spend for our uh, uh, infrastructure gaps. 
uh, the size of our fund is only three to five billion euro. So it means only one percent. It is only one percent of our needs. So this is the place for Tresis Fund, private investors, public investment, and of course for the private and public partnership that we can implement uh, to to address all these needs uh, in our region. So Thank this you. is my short comment. Thank you. We're closing in on, on our last few minutes. And if I don't ask this question, there's going to be a virtual riot out there. And you can imagine what it will be. We got many questions about new members. And so I'll put it broadly and combine a couple. But we have Bulgarian from the United States. You know, what are the possibilities of adding new members to the three C's initiative? Now, this is really beyond this panel because this is a three C's fund. But the question out there, and maybe it's more for, for Adam and, and Andreas and, and, um, and Georgette, but Beata and, and, um, and, and, and Joe, please jump in. What about Ukraine? Where does Ukraine fit in the three C's vision? Or I should say, where does Ukraine fit in the three C's fund vision? As I understand it, you are allowed, the, the, the mandate is to invest in multinational cross-border projects has to involve at least one 3C state, can involve two 3 state states, but could also involve, a project could also involve one 3C state and a non 3 cs member state. So how should we be thinking, how should 3Cs be thinking about Ukraine? How should the West be thinking about the 3Cs initiative and the region of Central Europe as a whole? Maybe I'll, I'll turn to, 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 to Ambassador Moshbacker first and then, then Adam and then, if this is in your mandate, uh, Beata and, and, and Joe, please. Well, obviously, and Andres, of course. Obviously, uh, Ukraine is going to have to be rebuilt after this. Certainly, Ukraine's infrastructure. Uh, and I think uh, the question of bringing it into the three C's or not. Um, is a, is a good question. I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, I don't know, you have to weigh the risk uh, that will be uh, associated with that while the war is going on. But certainly when the war is over, uh, there will be real opportunities uh, and it will have to be cross-border with um, the countries that, that, that border Ukraine. Uh, if we believe that bringing the three C, uh, Ukraine into three C's would help uh, Ukraine, I, I would be all for it. Adam? I mean, I, I don't know if I have a, a specific answer to the, the question. I think that's, you know, for Ukraine and the, the three C's initiative member countries to ultimately decide I think Ambassador Mosbacher is right. If you put it into a broader context of Ukraine is going to have to be rebuilt, Ukraine is going to have to be further tied into the three C's initiative countries and ultimately the rest of Western Europe. And it goes back to some of my comments uh, earlier, right? If it is about a north-south axis and then integrating more into Western Europe and away from Russia, well, Ukraine is going to try to do that exact same thing, right? So they're going to have to try to achieve what the three C's initiative is trying to achieve, and they're going to have to rebuild a lot of infrastructure. So whether it's a formal partner or uh, somebody who works closely or a country that works closely with it, it feels like there's an obvious need there. And I think, you know, if I were in government and, you know, I have lots of friends in this administration is as you think about, you know, integrating Ukraine into the West and the rebuild that's going to have to happen, you know, I think three C's would obviously be, be a part of that in some capacity. Andres, you're living the three C's world. You're in the president's office. Uh, how, how are you thinking about Ukraine and three C's? Well, um, I think we, we need to, to look at the three C's initiative as whole as a dynamically developing project. Well, on one hand, of course, the 12 countries of three C's region have fixed their basic and, and main aims. Uh, interests, uh, well, priority areas where to cooperate. On the other hand, um, well, the situation is dynamically changing all the time. And of course, uh, on one hand, uh, we have invited President Zelensky to, to the summit. 
Um, well, to decide more, well, the discussions of, about Ukraine, of course, are, are going on uh, among all three, uh, all 12 member countries. And of course, to make decisions, we need consensus decision. We, we need all countries to agree how to expand uh, possibly the uh, three seas area. On one hand, of course, Latvian, as we are presidency and our um, task is on one hand to consolidate uh, the project to make the project to make pro make projects run more uh, to be run more efficiently. Uh, on the other hand, we of course we we need to to be open to um, expansion to uh, cooperation in other regions, and that's what we are doing. That's why why we have invited also uh, countries like uh, well, Canada or or um, Korea or. or or uh, France and, and uh, United Kingdom. Well, um, we need to think about it, but, but formal decisions, of course, need to be made by all member countries. So we, we, we have to look at this project as a, as a movie. It, it's not snapshot. Uh, and, and we need to discuss, well, uh, two months ago was uh, one situation Two months later, the situation is completely different. Two months later, let's say, um, Ukraine has made a formal application to EU. Three, two, three seas regions, all countries are EU member countries. Well, all these aspects we need to keep in mind. But of course, I, I can say we are discussing, discussing among all of the member countries the situations and, and how, how to, to make, make the better solution. Well, I'm going to give the last words to Joe and then and then Beata there. Beata will have the closing closing yeah. shot. If, if I may, I mean, from a, I'm going to talk about this from a purely financial perspective in terms of raising capital and deploying capital, um, and and from a fund perspective, Greece makes perfect sense in terms of raising capital yeah. and deployment yeah. and risk profile. So you're you're approaching the same group of investors for a similar risk profile. It makes perfect sense. Uh, Ukrainian investment is a different risk pro profile entirely for many, many reasons. What I will say, though, is I think it's incumbent upon all of us to play a role in rebuilding Ukraine. We all have, we have expertise, we have know-how, we have experience. So surely there is a way of us all finding a way to bring that experience and expertise to bear and find a separate pot of capital that can assist in the rebuilding of Ukraine. I think that's incumbent upon all of us. We want convergence, we want cohesion, we want partnership, so we should find a way. Fantastic. Beata. Yes, this is exactly what I wanted to underline. Uh, the, the fund is, uh, the, the, it is different than the uh, initiative on the political level. So uh, when we start to talk about the money and the investment, uh, we know how to distinguish the TRISIS initiative and the TRISIS fund. Uh, we have, uh, as, as uh, uh, Joe mentioned, uh, the risk profile, uh, we uh, decide to uh, have the three type of investors. So the core sponsors, it means the representatives, uh, mainly the development uh, banks from our region, the Trisis region. A supranational sponsor, it means international uh, development institution like EBRD, EID, e EBI, uh, EIB, uh, World Bank, and uh, the others. Uh, and uh, the third part of investor, it is limited partners. And uh, uh, this limited partners are uh, this private equity that we are looking uh, around the world. So uh, in, in this uh, aspect, uh, how we think about the others, uh, members of the 3 initiative, from the uh, fund perspective, it is a different story. Because uh, if any uh, private investors from Ukraine wants to be a member of the uh, TRISIS fund and invest uh, in, in this region through the TRISIS fund, it is possible, yeah? But we're thinking in the other uh, side, how to help through the fund to uh, recover Ukraine after war. So it is a different aspect. From the financial point of view, we, need, uh, we, we can have a number of investors around the world doesn't matter where we're from. Uh, but from the other hand, 
what uh, and who could, uh, could be the member of the TRISIS initiative, it depends only on the political level and only from our presidents. So I, I wanted to add about the three types of investors and the risk profile, which was mentioned uh, and underlined by, by Joe. So uh, probably it is uh, only the beginning of our long journey. And as uh, Ambassador uh, Taikmani uh, mentioned, it is only beginning. We never know what will be the next step. And we have a number of questions about Greece, Finland, Moldova, uh, Ukraine, uh, Albania, and the others, Western Balkans. So this is a different story. And the fund it is a little bit different story, even if it's inspired by a politician, but driven by the market rules. And, and I guess rules. I would add that whatever the three C's fund does it for Ukraine or Western Balkans, it will always the fund will always be focused on commercially viable projects, which can be helpful, but it's not an assistance program. It's a commercially driven initiative. You know, with that exactly. said, I have one quick question to Joe and that lots of questions, a lot of requests for your briefing. Is that something we can share? Uh, yes, let me double check it, but um, I, uh, before I get into trouble with compliance, but I think so, but I'll come back to you on Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody, Andres, Joe, Adam, Bayada, Georgette, Thank you so much for your time. You really underscored, you know, the dramatic challenge of infrastructure in Central and Eastern Europe. You highlighted how the Three Cs Fund is playing a unique and an innovative a, a role in addressing that problem. But what is a public-private partnership that, in, that is having real impact, real investments? And you kind of outlined a bit the way forward. So we're looking forward uh, to future meetings like this. We know it's going to be a highlight of the Three Cs summit and business forum that Andres and his president are hosting in Riga this June. And we thank you again for your time. And we thank everyone in the audience for participating today. Thank you. Have a great day. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Bye.